people are less trusting. There's yes. so much more noise. And I think I think it's actually harder because everybody's saying it's so easy and you think you can door dash your success. Do you have it figured know. out that your people buy out of Rolls Royce magazine and not Facebook? And you're like, oh, I got to have a Facebook page. And that's you're just doing things for the sake of doing things. Yeah. You're not doing things that cause a wheel to start moving. Very there nice is sense. nothing more powerful than going, I know how to make money. I know how to serve people. I know how to sell to people. Are you the executive or professional who is missing the own expectations of yourself? Are you spinning your wheels right now and trying to figure out how do I make my business work? I've stepped out of corporate life and I'm trying to figure out what is going to be the secret source for me. Well, today my guest is Andrea Leon and she specializes in finding out your secret source. She's going to teach you how to stand out, most importantly, in a really chaotic and crowded marketplace right now. The best thing about that is only your value matters. <laughs> so why listen to Andrea? She's been around 20 years in corporate life and she stepped away from that so she could do that in a service-based business of her own today. And she's now a leadership coach. She also does mindset work and helps people with therapeutic behavior. And that's a really key way to help you transcend to the next place for you. Hey, we've been friends for a few years now, so this will flow nice and easy. Andrea, how are you doing today? I'm doing awesome. How are you? <laughs> I'm great. I was very excited for this. I know we talked about it a long time, but here we are. We've managed to get calendars aligned and synced. So let's dive straight in without further ado. I have awesome. one question to kick this thing off, and then we'll just okay. free flow this in a fireside conversation. With the people who come to start service-based businesses, typically coaches, but it could be other service-based businesses too, yep. what is the problem that they bring to your doorstep? Start there. I will say the most common statement that I hear from people is, I I want to not only, I want to be a successful business owner, but not do I just want to be, I want to feel like it. And right now I don't feel like a successful business owner. And so inevitably like the, to like if I, if I talked about it in like, if I diagnosed it, if they were in my doctor's office, I'd say, oh, so you're having some imposter syndrome, huh? <laughs> so when, when they use those words, successful yes. or feel they want to yes. feel yeah can you maybe drill down into that a little bit because i i want whoever's watching up until this point because they're still here a few minutes in thinking is yeah. this what when they define success how do i define it and when they talk about those feelings what are those feelings so a lot of them will talk about i'm doing the things like i've got the website i've got my linkedin profile or or they'll or they will talk about the things that are half baked they think everything is half baked right they've I, my website is here but i need to redo it and my social media i need to be better at this like they'll talk about all the things that they're doing and they'll say and i just i want that feeling of feeling like a successful business owner and it's not it is partially it's revenue generating right so part of it is there may be, most of them are not meeting their revenue numbers yet. Um, but that's, it's interesting. That's not the primary thing that they're frustrated by. The primary thing that they're frustrated by is they don't feel as confident as they did in themselves when they were in their professional career. Yeah. So they haven't mastered this business ownership identity yet to feel confident that they're wearing that suit. They're either using certifications. Like I went and they'll tell me about their certifications. Almost every single one of them has two to three certifications and like, Okay, so pot kettle black, you see my wall, like I'm not, you know, I am, I'm with you people on the certification junkieism of, oh, I just need this one more certification and then I'll have everything I need to be valuable or et cetera. And so it's what it is, is they, they will go, I left, they're literally having somewhat of an identity crisis. They are not feeling like they're in that mojo where they were in their career. They're doing things, they're having success, but it's not feeling feeling like it's that complete picture that they have confidence that this they can see this three and five and 10 years down the road working for them. Yeah. That's really what it is. I'm definitely going to come back to identity, but I want to talk about that money piece because anybody watching this who's a service-based practitioner now or thinking about stepping out of the corporate world to do this, the number one question is, how do I replace my paycheck? Yeah. And I can't survive without it. So how much do you think the financial pressure valve impacts the confidence level and 
Can you perhaps talk about that as a topic for a moment? And then we'll, well, we'll shift to that identity piece. Yeah, absolutely. More so there's a so there's far more people making this leap now than there were in 2017 when I made the leap. Back in 2017, we like you and I met shortly after that, and we were like anomalies, right? On link, you know, on, on LinkedIn, and people were looking at us. Now there's so many people making that leap. The majority there, I would probably say 80% are making that leap, and they are in charge of an airplane that already has passengers on it. So meaning they have commitments, they have mortgages, they have car payments, they have spouses or partners or kids, or like there are other people depending on them yeah. And so the pressure for them, the it's they'll it, they'll well, we talk about it from money terms, but really what it is is disappointing the people that we're responsible for. And it's the pressure of being a disappointment and letting them down that yeah. is weighing in the every single person in the that I've had like con, conversations with and then you know had been worked with, it, inevitably it's the people in the back of their mind that are around them that they're going to let them down. Which, if they let them down, then they're letting themselves down. So, so what do you think the tie is? So, the financial pressure valve. Yep. What's causing that drop in confidence? Because I see this all the time with executives that I work with. They will come to me and they'll say, "I don't know what's wrong with me. I used to be like supremely confident, and now I'm in this increased responsibility position. I, I, I find my self esteem and my confidence to be lower. So, what do you think it is for the people you're talking with? Yeah. So for the former corporate pros who have gone into like coaching consulting, it's that there's been these, it's like these kind of, we're not used to failures. We're, we're coming at it with an expert's mindset. I should be an expert at this instead of coming to it as a learner's mindset. But inevitably everybody comes in and says, I don't have time. I don't have 10, I don't have 20 years to refigure this out. Right. And so it's kind of it's kind of like if you never rode a bike as a kid, I don't know who you are if you did that. But basically, if I handed somebody a, a bicycle nowadays who hadn't ridden a bike and said, hey, go ride a bike. For some reason, as adults, we do not have the grace for ourselves of I've never done this. I'm going to like I can conceptually do it. I can read the book. I can watch the video, et cetera. But when I get on it, it's going to be wobbly and it's not going to look great, et cetera. It's like we literally want to, I'm going to use my DoorDash, right? We want to DoorDash the persona, put it on and go out in the world and be great at it. Yeah. And I and I hold my hand out. This is just <laughs> me because I, I had in my mind, well, if you can run a hundred million dollar company, you can build one. <laughs> yeah. And and that is not the case at all. Well, no, because so, there's 25 more hats to wear than what you had to wear before. Yeah, that's right. You it don't have the budgets. You yeah. don't have the budget. You don't have the safety net. You don't have the team. You don't have the budget. So you don't have the room for failure. In corporate world, we our confidence erodes because corporate tells us, right, companies have failures, teams have failures, and high performance take it upon themselves that I wasn't a better leader, right? Well, but we but then we have room for risk and mistakes because there's a budget. There's 10 more people to go get things in. You go out into this space and it's you're it. You're you're the you're, you're the top of the hill and everything rises and falls whether you get this right or not. And suddenly you've got to run marketing, you've got to run sales, you have to run client delivery, you have to run operations, admin, right? You're doing you, there's this whole engine that you have to run that you were not trained to run. <laughs> yeah, and, and and some of those things you you won't enjoy. No, you won't like them. Because because you're either the reason why you didn't do sales in your career, because you didn't like sales, or the reason why you didn't work in an operational admin role and you did do sales is because you didn't like the admin side of the business. So right. don't, yeah, I, I think that's exactly what's happened with me is that I, I was great on the front end of the, any business. But as soon as somebody said, can you just put this in a file? I was lost. You know, it's like, OK, yeah. so I don't have any systems. I don't know how to tie everything together. I'm terrible with technology. <laughs> I understand technology, but terribly using technology to administer. Or being the decision. It's not just using yeah. it. I have to decide which CRM I'm yeah, using. Right. I have to decide which video tool I'm using. I have to fit. Like you have to make these decisions where before you had people telling you what, like they were serving you options and telling you which decision, like guiding you in those yeah. space. Or you had experts that said, here's what we're going to do. And here's why you're like, great. <laughs> Well, this is, this is good because I was, I was going to ask you about identity and we will come back to it. So I've made, I've yeah. made, a, made a little pad here. But but now I want to ask you about, so somebody watching this and they've stayed with us 
Congratulations, you're a high performer. If if you're watching this now, the question you're probably asking is, okay, so what do I do first? Yeah. This is all great. You're telling us that I can make it out of corporate life and I can build a business in a service-based practitioner role. But tell me, where do I go first? Some people will have already maybe got some clients, done some beta program for their product or service. Yeah, great. But, but what do they do when they they are spinning their wheels and they are feeling stuck and they're unsure about what's next? What would you say to those people? The first, it's the it's so interesting. It's first of all, where where are you struggling most? Right. It's the, and so it's this looking, which seems like a cart horse question. <laughs> But you ha- but you have to kind of stop for just a minute. Most people will say, well, once I get the clients, it's great. And it goes great. What you have to learn is what is the right system for you to get those clients to rinse and repeat. Yeah. Right. And it's also for you to stop for a moment and go, okay, great. What don't I what don't I know? And instead of trying to learn how to do it yourself, it's learn what needs to be done and then ask yourself how quickly or who could I get to do this in my business for me so that I'm because most of them will most of them are low funded like we're bootstrapping our businesses right so it is kind of like it's great are you looking at your business from right marketing sales delivery operations admin leadership right and the one thing I tell people is is that in that first year you're going to pivot like you're just going to pivot a lot you're going to start in one path etc and so Quit trying to create this whole perfect person, perfect website, perfect persona, et cetera, and literally brass tacks basics. It is you have to be able to pick an one audience that has one problem that you can create an outcome for and rinse and repeat that until you get to six figures. Got it. Like you just got to do that. And, and until you do that so that you can focus and then go, ah, so case in point, like my example was, um, I've failed miserably my first year. <laughs> Don't we all fail miserably our first year of business? Finally started gaining traction and what I started really like, I'm like, okay, so I'm getting clients. I'm able to have convert conversations. I'm getting, I'm able to sell them. What I realize is it's taking me so long to get clients. Like I have to go speak in an event. Then I have to have follow-up calls and I get X number of clients. And I'm like, okay, well that works. But I, unless I'm speaking two and three times a month, I'm not getting enough exposure. So either I have to solve for speaking two or three times a month, or I have to be able to go, okay, here's who I have been working with and who has said yes and how I can rinse and repeat this wheel. How else can I gain access to them? Is it a referral partner? Is it an introduction? Is it, could I hire a marketing admin to help me do some online things to get them like some outreach, whatever. Right. So you have to kind of stop and look and go, where are you the bottleneck at right now in your business? Because if you're just, if you were going to sit back and say, well, I just want to sit here and deliver services. Well, first of all, you don't deserve to be in business. You might as well just go back to a job because that's a job. That's not running a a business. That's a job. So the first thing is you have to decide and commit that you are going to become, that you are an actual business owner and you are solely responsible for making this work. And you must own that journey. (laughs) Like you have to decide and commit. I am a business owner and I am building a successful business. Like you almost have to make the state, make that statement and then commit to going and looking at your business as a set of steps and processes. And then looking at where is the next, where do I need help right now that moves my business, keeps continuing my business forward. It's not reinventing a new service. It's not going and building another product. It's not, you know, et cetera. It's you have, if you've done that traction and if you haven't done that, that's the, like, that's the first place I tell people. I'm like, you have to quit trying to serve everybody out of all the people that you've served. Let's go data mining, (laughs) right? And go, what's that red thread of the best customers you had that paid, that loved your outcomes, et cetera, and go, great, here were five to seven of them. Let's only go get five or seven more of those and let's leave everybody else out of the way. Absolutely. I love that. And it, yeah, I've done this exercise with Eben Pagan. You know Eben Pagan? I don't. The luminary no, in this industry. You know, he, I think he's the guy who, who always says, I created the word avatar. He's the one, he's ever heard of that movie Avatar? Well, before yeah. Avatar, I created the word avatar. It didn't exist. Oh so he's been around 20, 25 years. But yeah, he, he was the one who highlighted for me, James, of your top 10 to 15 clients, they all have something in common. What is yeah. it? Yeah. 
that that's powerful and i want to come back to you said so many things and i've made some notes here so i i, I like the analogy analogy you started off there with first things first and and the analogy i've heard before is like imagine a hose pipe in your yard and there's lots of kinks in the hose pipe yep. well you can't unkink the one nearest where the water comes out because you still have all the kinks back up the chain yeah so you've got to go all the way back to where's the water coming from the source yes um unkink the first one so the yes starts to flow and i yes. think you were talking about there you know ultimately we were talking about marketing it was kind of maybe that first kink and so it makes me think of some questions for you I, i'd love to get your perspective so marketing discuss for a small based business a small business service practitioner who's maybe in their first two you know one to three years but more like two or three years still spinning their wheels a little bit what would you say about marketing today that's changed you, maybe? And that they yeah. should hear that today. Um, I would say two things. Number one, if you haven't sold organically, repeatedly, or marketed organically, you have no business paying for marketing. Because you're going to go and ask a marketer to go build a funnel for you, et cetera. And the first thing they're going to ask you is for who? And so, and why? And what are the ways? Like, they're going to ask, they're going to ask you information to help them be successful. Mm -hmm. And so I go, the first thing is, is number one, have you done some organic? And can you rinse, repeat? And do you have that red thread lane? And then the second thing is, is pick one path or one platform, right? Pick one place. Where does that sweet spot customer hang out and spend time? Because everybody's like, oh, you got to be everywhere. You got to, you got to have, be on Google. You or like, you have to be on YouTube. You have to be on LinkedIn. You have to be on Instagram. You have to actually master one and then expand, right? I got to say something on that because I heard the other ahead. day, Rolls Royce are not on Facebook. No, they're and I was not. Like, that's such a that's such a unique perspective of marketing. Yeah. Where will you find the Rolls Royce advert? You'll find it in a golfing magazine. Yes, because that's where the people who drive Rolls Royces are hanging out. Yes, I don't know. We even know what the magazine's called. Let's call it Golf Monthly, right? I don't know. <laughs> but but that was just a, a great example of what you're saying. Is don't be on Facebook if your people aren't there. Yeah, now look, your people are there, but maybe not to buy your thing. No, they might be there for another reason. So I love that, and I think it's a a lesson that I had to learn the hard way because I did the, you know, let's go in every channel and see if we can figure this out. But but ultimately, it's always come back to, no, I'm just on one main channel. And then I have a an additional channel which I can leverage, which is this one. You know, most yes. people watch you and I on YouTube. That's where they will yeah, say. Yeah. But that's not where I do business. No. But, but I do want to educate them on you. Yeah. And I want Andrea to be seen. So that's where we put you. Put you where you could be on right. TV. You know, that's, that's but if you have it figured moment. out that your people buy out of Rolls Royce magazine and not Facebook, and you're like, oh, I gotta have a Facebook page, and that's you're just doing things for the sake of doing things. Yeah, you're not doing things that cause a wheel to start moving. Yeah, I call like, it like it's just like throwing darts, like they're just kind of throwing random darts versus like here's where we're going. So if you haven't found out where they hung hang out, you don't you haven't found out do they go to networking groups? What books do they read? Right? What what YouTube channels are they watching, <laughs> right? Things like that. Or are they watching YouTube? That kind of thing. You've got to do some organic first. And it does take a little bit of human capital to do that. And when you do that, the one thing I will say is that also make sure that if you do decide to start hiring for marketing, make sure that marketing company has done marketing for your type of business and your client specifically. I agree with that. We've made so many mistakes, right? Sunk costs that you do. I hired a marketer because they were in this community of experts that I knew. And they were like, I, sh I should have seen this as a red flag and I didn't. But the first, when I was like, here's what I need and he done, they're like, oh my gosh, I've always wanted to do this for a business made simple coach, meaning I was there first, meaning I was paying them to learn how to do marketing for me. not hiring somebody who said, yep, I have done marketing for your type of coaching, et cetera. And we know if you're looking for this type of client or this type of client, here's the two formulas that work best. Yeah. I think they're vital questions. I asked them, did you work in my market? Can you show me examples? And can I talk to one of those examples? Yes. And if I can't talk to a reference, I'm never going to work with that company. And if you're watching this and Andre is telling you and I'm telling you, don't do it. You, you, don't have do it. To, you have to come up with a marketing team who have demonstrated capability and deliberate practice in your space. And they've got plenty of evidence. You know, I think that would be a really good advice. Well, the other I, thing I wanna, I wanna you have to, to 
Yeah. Well, yeah. well the other thing you have to do for marketing. Same thing. So marketing. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say the other thing for marketing is you have to give them a way to get people into your business. So if you say, I need marketing for a $10,000 high ticket sale, that's not what it's for. <laughs> And that's what most of them are coming out because they see all the things online, all the gurus online of sell your high ticket. First of all, nobody's going to YouTube and not going to hand you $10,000 when they've never seen you before. So you have to be prepared to give your give marketers a, a, a ladder for people to step into with you. And it right. So that's why I go, you have to do some manual and some right, et cetera. Then, then invest. Do not invest first because your marketing will not save your business if you do not have the things in place to save your business already. Uh, and I, I, I think I'd add to that is my experience of paid advertising. If you haven't got down organic marketing, then it don't will pay. Amplify the same result. So you'll you'll just get more of the same result. So if you exactly. don't have clients from your marketing, when you throw lots of money at it, you won't have clients because the audience and the message are not connecting. So there's Correct. Just need some time. Yes. I think yeah, trial and error. So let's get this ship to sales, the same kind let's of Let's go to sales. I go tell I go to people yeah. first. I say before you do marketing, you better master sales. Wow. Okay. So yeah, I do it the other way around. I'm like, market your brand, because I would love to market me so people know who I am first, and then I can sell to someone, right? Yeah, but you were yeah. a sales guy before. Most people have never been in sales. And so I go, before you master marketing, you have to master sales. Because the whole point is marketing funnels to you people to put through the sales process. Now, here's the other thing I would hear is, yeah, once I get people on a call, I'm great. I'm like, how long do your sales calls last? Well, you know, usually from an hour to two hours. And I'm like, what? (laughs) That's not a sales call. Yeah, that's a, that that's is, a friendship. That's catching up. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, and did you coach them on that call? And they're like, well, yeah, because everybody says, give them a sample of your coaching. I'm like, did they sign up for a coaching call or did they sign up for a sales call? Because it's not the same. Like yeah. the doctor does not diagnose you in the waiting room. Why are you coaching in the sales call? I think you can't get surprised. So you can have a call with somebody and they don't ask you about your program or anything that you're doing until near the end. And you may have already spent 45 minutes getting to know them and understanding all the pain in their life. But all I, I push those guys out to a second call. What do you think about that? I, I agree. Just, oh yeah, you want to talk about my program? Oh, let's do a call on that. So I absolutely course, agree. Separate. Yeah. Yes, I totally agree with you, James. And it's it's because who's controlling the call? And there's right. nothing wrong with listening to somebody and hearing about their pain, et, et cetera, et cetera. I always tell people if you're doing like the first call is a filtering, like it's a qualifying. Yep. You're listening about their pain. You're listening to their story, what, et cetera, et cetera. And you're assessing, does my service help solve that? And you better be assessing the second thing most people don't think about, and I've had multiple conversations with people, and I had to go through this too, was do you want to solve that problem for that person? Yeah. You're qualifying them. Are they going to be a good client for you? And when we talk, when I kind of start talking to coaches about that, they're like, because their b- bank account needs things, needs dollars in it. So they just have yes mode. And I'm like, not every, not We have a saying in our household, not all money is good money. And so I'm a huge fan of that piece and going, okay. So what what would be the criteria? How would you give some advice to people watching this is what would be two or three things that you'd be looking out for to answer that question? How do I know if this is a target client or somebody I'd like to work with or what would be red flags? Right. So I coach my clients and I do this. I have three to five questions I ask. Who are you? What do you do? That kind of thing, right? Type of business. Second of all, what's the big challenge you're facing? Okay. And so, you know, my team is a mess or, you know, I'm stuck and I've tried every, you know, can't do, you know, not getting progress or I've hired three marketers or this or that or whatever. Like you're trying to figure out what the problem is. When they tell me the problem, then the set, the next question I ask them is, how have you tried to solve this? And what I'm looking for in that, and that's what I have coaches, you know, kind of assess for themselves, is where do you want people to be in that journey? Do you want people who have just discovered they have this problem and they're looking for their very first step of solving it? Mm-hmm. Like, if you're that type of coach, that's great. I'm not. I suck at triage. Like, I'm not a triage-friendly nurturing nurse. I want people who are br- her a little bit burnt. <laughs> So I'm looking for, I've read books or I've gone to this webinar or I changed, like they've done some things to try and and fix on their own first because it lets me know that they're solution seeking 
and that, you know, that they're solution seeking um, versus, well, this is the very first time I've ever reached out for anything. I'm like, okay, you have too many things to learn. I'm not your helpful person, right? So it's knowing where, who, where you, where that, where that ideal client is in their journey of pain, problem yeah. solving kind of thing. Um, and then I always ask them, what are you hoping somebody offer? What are you hoping somebody helps you with most? Which I also am looking for them, their self awareness and their self accountability. Like if somebody says, well, like I had somebody who said, I've had five coaches and I'm like, well, what was the problem? And they're like, actually the problem was me. Like regardless of the coaches, right. like the problem was me. I wasn't clear. Like, and I'm like, somebody who says that versus somebody who says, well, I've had three coaches and I fired all of them because none of them know what the hell they're doing. Why am I putting my head on the chopping block next? Like, yeah. <laughs> no, right. thank you. Right. Kind of thing. So I'm looking for their level of self-awareness and are they owning the problem? So I have criteria for my clients and that's what I tell coaches. I'm like, who is the criteria for your client? Is there a type of background if they've gone through? Is there a type of this or that? And if you don't have criteria, then you're number one. You don't have, you shouldn't be in business either. No, <laughs> you shouldn't say that. But it's but it because it's like you can't say yes to everybody. You you've got to does you've got to decide who you serve best and who appreciates you. This is an exchange. This is not just a transaction of dollars. This is an exchange of time and energy with people. And there has to be an ex, you have to be able to get some personal win out of this too. Yeah, I call it team sport. Yeah. You know, it I'm is a team sport. sport. I'm, yeah. a, I'm a coach. If it's not a team sport, I don't enjoy it. Correct. The so is be, the client. I don't, I don't want to be just a teacher, and I certainly yeah. don't want them to be telling me their their life story inside the company or inside the business. In your case, um, let's let's keep going. This is good. I think we've got some good marketing ideas. A rewind yeah. for that. If you you missed them, go back to the rewind, and some sales ideas. I want to talk about client delivery and yeah. your development of a program. Somebody may be questioning. Well, I don't know if my program's good enough, and that's the problem. But what would be some things you think about in terms of what does excellence look like in execution when somebody's doing? When you've got a client, how do you make sure you keep them? Here's my thing: is always go in with a plan, but the client's in charge. So coaches always have a plan. Like coaches, if you don't have a plan yet, like the whole thing about taking the sale, like the sales call is you're already in your mind formulating, here's where I'm going to start with them. Every So the, and the always say for coaching, solve a quick win, get, ease their pain, ease some pain as quickly as possible. Nobody wants to get into a coaching program and go, okay, in six months, your pain will be eased. Solve a front door problem. It what just, would be a timeline? What, tell us how fast could you solve a problem with somebody? I can solve some a problem with somebody in under an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, right. I, I, don't, I don't think every coach gets that. So it's good for you to say it. That, yeah, yeah, I agree. I think solve something in an hour, then a day, then seven days, and then just keep doing it. Yes. Yeah. So the biggest first thing that you can do is solve for them is for them to unpack their ownership, like their business problem or whatever. So one of the very first things, if you just do a strong intake session where you ask them questions like, how did you get into business? Where are you guys at now? What are your strengths? Like if you just help people unpack and then go, hey, based on all the things that you said to me, it sounds like this is the burning problem. What if we solve for this over the next 30 days? And they're like, "In th you literally solved a problem for them. You let them unload all of the things they've been carrying around in their head that their spouse doesn't want to hear, their friends don't want to hear, right? All of their other friends that are still in corporate world have no idea how to help them at, in, right, and unpack. And if they're asking questions from other business, <laughs> you're laughing. I'm laughing because they still, those people will still give you plenty of advice, even though they've never done it themselves. I know they've never done it, but they're like, you should do this, right? You can take <laughs> advice from other, you know, other business owners, but they don't know you. Like yeah. they don't know what phase of business is you're in. They don't, they're just, they're just telling you like, here's how I solved that problem. You should do this. Yeah. The first thing you can do is if you just let your client unpack, you've literally let them unload all the stress they've been carrying in their mind. Right. And, and go, 
hey, guess what? You're right. This is the, if we solve this problem, these other things probably get solved really quickly too, Uh, right? And so, and then go, great, let's just focus on this for right now. The biggest gift you can give people is just a place to focus and confidence it can change. Now, guess what? Your clients have no clue the quality of your courses, your template. They don't know any of that. They have no idea what to expect. We have all this pressure on ourselves of I have to have this and this and this and this. And it's like, Guess what? Most of your clients are just happy somebody's there showing up to let them unload and then go, what did you think you were going to do? And they're like, well, I thought I had, it could do this option or this option or this option. And you're like, which one did you want to do most, but you were afraid, but you thought would be the worst, you know, we were afraid of. And they're like, well, it's this one because, you know, if this doesn't work or that doesn't work, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. And then you just ask some questions like, what is the likelihood of all of those other things happening? And they're like, eh, not really high. Yeah. And so then you go, so does it sound like maybe that might, you know, so which option really would you do if you just had full confidence that none of the bad, bad things are really going to happen? Or that you go, and if those things did happen, what would you do? And they'll tell you, like, I would do this or I would do that. And they're like, so you really in your mind really do have a plan for for this? And they're like, yeah, I guess I do. And so, like, they just needed somebody to unpack it for them. <laughs> That's all. Hey, this is James. I'm jumping in the middle of the video here because I want to let you know that there's an opportunity by clicking the link in the description underneath this video to meet me for 30 minutes. In that meeting, I will give you a two or three strategies or two to three big ideas that will change your career, your mission, your business, and maybe even your life if you'll commit to acting on those things. Now, I want to let you know, I'm not there to sell you anything. I don't have anything to sell you, but I do want to have a conversation with you so you can get into momentum and start to execute against your priority activities. Let's just drill on that a little bit because I I think most business owners, new business owners in their first few years would experience a a level of fear different to anything they've experienced before. So I'm not saying it's any greater in terms of its intensity because if you're an employee, you'd you'd sometimes fear being let go or you'd fear messing up a project or you'd fear that you let somebody down. But when you become a business owner, you fear that you're not going to make money. You fear that you can't find a client. You fear that you didn't deliver enough. Well, you feel like the airplane's going to crash. Like really? your fear is the airplane is going to crash versus that's, in that's your right. corp- corporate. So how, you feel how, like you have a lifeline that won't you, let you How crash. do you help people? I want to ask you, how do you yeah. help people? Know? I mean, if this goes in a particular way, maybe we'll pause for a second on that and then come back yeah. to this question. But I want, how do you help people navigate the fear that we're describing now? So I get them. So a business basics. Okay. Do you see your business as this basic set of five systems that make your business work, right? In your career, you had somewhat of a career tra- path line or job description or et cetera, right? Most times, first times in business, there's no, we don't have just a basic project plan of business. So the first thing is, is just basically your business is five simple systems that make your business work, yeah. right? That's it. So there's some fundamentals. Then there is the reinstilling. Sometimes you have to reinstill confidence in the person, right? So I have people tell me, like I have, I when I first start with my clients, I literally make them tell me how they got to business. So I have this timeline of them. I basically make them give me a resume story. And so when we're having those, you know, those things, et cetera, I go, okay, great. Let's look at your business. Which system is struggling, right? Which system is the system that 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 you can that you can that we can fix right now that doesn't require you to invest more money to something else, right? That we can fix. And then I go. And if you were, right, I kind of pull in their history of them and go, hey, you've been in this situation before in other ways. How would, like, how, how, what did you do? How did you find strength, et cetera, to do this? A lot of times I just ask them, I'm like, what do you do? How do you spend time managing your stress? What works for you? So sometimes you have to stop talking about, this is the thing about, right? You have to decide, are you coaching the business or are you coaching the business owner? I coach Mm -hmm. the business owner to run a better business. I'm not coaching a window cleaning company. Well, I wouldn't coach them anyway. So that's, but, that's, right? that's the thing I want to come back to. So let's come back to that bit because I know yeah. we talked about your program in the green room yeah. before we came on air. Just quickly though, before we jump off this, what are the five basics? You mentioned there's five basics to the business. Somebody make five basics. Number yeah. one, leadership. Everything rises and falls on leadership. You, which is you. 
the mindset, your capability for visioning, your capability, like it's you, you have to continue. Going into business is who said it? Gay Hendricks in, in, um, the, in the big leap, the leap. Yeah. Yeah. The big leap. So Gay Hendricks said it. And he said, deciding to go into business for yourself is actually a personal, he calls it a spiritual journey. I call it a professional, like a personal development journey. If mm-hmm. you're not on the personal development journey for yourself, you're improving your mindset, you're move, improving your how to manage stress, your, you know, communication skills, things like that. Number one is leadership. And then I'm going to talk about these other four. They don't necessarily go in this order until they're all working well together, but it is, it's leadership, it's marketing, it's sales, client delivery, right? Your clients, et cetera, and mm-hmm. operations at an admin. Okay, Five basic- yeah, I just wanted to make sure people could make a note of those things. Yeah. So if you don't have a strength in one of those five things, Andrea is the person to come to. So in the show notes, you can go down and there'll be links there where you can connect with her, but also book calls with her and maybe even download some free information that's going to get you moving in those five areas. Yes. So let's, let's keep going. Um, okay. What do I want to go next? Earlier on, we were talking about uh, leaving corporate life. Yep. And I, I always have this notion of, the reason why I think people find it difficult to leave corporate life is because they're leaving their identity behind. It is true. It's so much of it. So talk a little bit about that and then how you perhaps overcome the identity challenges that people have when they are coming to you, working with yeah. that kind of coaching or service-based business. So the first thing is we talk about the difference of corporate life to business life. In corporate life, there was this trajectory that you had to go through where you had to do certain work, have certain results to get the job title promote right so you had to you had to go you had to go do these other things first in the business world it's interesting you have to show up as that person <laughs> like you have to like you have to just be that person now doing the things that matter that lead to the right outcomes so there's a, there's a shift that has to happen there and so that's so the thing that i do differently with my clients is before we start working on your five business systems we start working on the first business system, which is the leader. Mm-hmm. And we have to paint an identity of who you are right now that is already capable, has the talents and skills and the experience that can that can't that is actually valuable and that is valuable that people want to solve a problem. And so I take people through, I actually take people through three assessments together <laughs> to help them remind themselves. Cause again, the ex the cor- corporate world gives us an external identity that we comfortably coast on. And it's a way for us not to have to work on any of our internal self-identity. In this space, you've got to work on your self-identity first. Like if you've detached from that, not spent time there. And if you don't want to, don't call me because we're not going to talk. We're not going to be good friends. <laughs> like it's just not going to happen. <laughs> but I do, I do. I take people, I help, I help them uncover a clear why. And it's not a why of serving other people. It's literally their own unique why operating system that is like their battery operating system, their strengths, their working genius. And we put a picture of that together, which helps them go, ah, I'm this person who loves helping other people be successful. I make sense of crazy problems. I make things super easy for people. And then what that does is they feel this confidence. They have words about themselves that are true. We turn their services into that. Now, when they're out telling people about themselves or services, et cetera, it's very authentic. It's very natural. And people love it and gravitate to it. And the people who don't love it don't gravitate to it, which is exactly what we want. Yeah. Repel some repel some people you don't want to hang out with. Yeah, you have you gotta be, you gotta, right? And so we work on the words and this proof. Like your strengths, your YOS, your work, they're proof you are who you are. And you've shown it like in your career, we draw that red thread of how they like play when they've been happiest in their career, when they've been most confident. And we go, great. Now let's just try to flip that script of who you're helping today, what you're helping them do, et cetera. Suddenly they have words for their brand. They have words for their services and they have words that literally authentically match them. Like they flow out of their mouths so easy and then people who gr- who love those same words literally go, who are you and how do I work with you? Yeah, it's, it's that right. simple. It's that yeah, simple. It's, uh, it's like hypnotic. Yeah, <laughs> It is. Words yeah. hypnotize people. Don't, yeah, don't get in a conversation with me because it could happen. 
<laughs> well, we, we can talk about that maybe in a we'll moment. We'll talk about that later, but it so, is. So you now literally, paint a picture. Yeah, you we, use we, words that work for about, you, that work for them. We've talked about those five basics. Yeah, we've, we've talked a little bit about sales and marketing. We talked about client delivery and and the importance of some of those things, and yep. where you place value. What I want to I want to keep connecting this to a specific type of individual that you can help now. So perhaps tell us. You talked earlier about businesses being half baked, or when people come to you that they've they've done some business. They're, they're not meeting the expectation themselves, and they're spinning their wheels a little bit. In some, what would be two or three failures, and even if you don't want to call that lessons that they've learned that they haven't overcome yet. So you start to see some characteristics of within my client pool, I see this, this, this as the challenges, hurdles, obstacles that are routinely coming up. What yeah. would that be with, for people that you work with specifically so we could we could get those people to reach out to you? They've gone and gotten two to three certifications. So they're wearing their certification badges mm -hmm. and they haven't found their voice in that. So they feel like what they're out there selling is their certifications. So they've, you know, and it's okay, but it, it they don't feel like they've found their own voice within that, right? So they've gone and gotten multiple certifications. Kind of in that process, what they've also done is kind of gone, I have all these pieces. How do I develop a program? Like, how do I put these things into an order of things to use? Because each certification program, and I'm not anti-certification. Like, I am, I'm not anti-certification at all. What I am is, is certifications are there to give you content and tell you how they think that you're going to make this win, right? Mm -hmm. They're there to just give you this, the shortcut, the DoorDash shortcut to success, right? Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is that most of the time, there are 10 to 20% of the people go and again, take those and make those work. 80% are having some kind of translation challenge. This is for this type of audience, I see that this could work for this type of audience. And I go, okay, well, great. You have to be the translator for that. Then you can't promote that. Right. So number one, they've got a couple, two, three certifications and they are, they, now they've come back around again and gone, okay, what's my identity in this? What's my formula for this? How am I putting this together in a way? And then how do I tell Pete stand out? What's my words and my voice that make me stand out that I'm I'm getting to work with the the clients that I love working with most, right? And that's the that's the biggest thing. The second phase that people kind of get to, that's that like kind of they're in their third, fourth year, kind of putting that together. The next phase they get to is they're they've um they're maxed on time. So they have clients, but they need more revenue, but they cannot work more hours in the day. Mm -hmm. So they've made themselves the magic they don't have they don't have a scalable business system or business. program yeah. you take them they, out of the business they the are business. meaning and they're yeah and they're there's literally like i i worked with a coach recently there was something he was offering and i i wanted to learn that from him um but i told him when we started that that there was no we were not going to continue to work longer term and he was like well i think we would work great together i said actually we will not and here's why your Thing that you're teaching me right now or selling to teach makes everything reliant on me to do, et cetera. I yeah. want to be able to have my business paying me even if I take a month off in July. And that means I have to now be able to build a team, build some systems and build things that scale. Because right now what you're teaching me is that I'm the, I'm the person in my business and everything rises and falls, which means if I get hit by a bus, my family doesn't eat. And mo there is a, there's a next phase where people get to where they, um, and it's not just raise your prices that you can only do that to a point that your market will let you do that. Right. At some point your market won't pay anymore they won't pay further. It's just true. The market dictate, the market will dictate. So you've got to then be able to, to put systems and processes in place for your sales, for your marketing. And then even for your delivery, can you scale or automate or, you know, elevate some of your services so that you're building an engine that runs that you're, that you're part of, but you're not pushing every lever that makes that engine run. I, think I got three things out there, maybe. And let me repay them to you. I think certificates. So if you're somebody who went out and got two or three certificates, uh, you potentially qualify here. And um, one is you've had a time crunch because you built a business of one or maybe yep. a business of one plus some contractors, but still you're the business. And if we take you out, there's no business. Yep. And then the other one is you don't have a system that supports 
the business when you're not around. And yeah. I always like um, Myron Golden is somebody who talks about this. Uh, you can, Myron Golden. You can ha- have a job and then you become self-employed and you own a job. Yes. So you work more hours, but you might make a bit more money, but you've got a lot more freedom. But if you want to, if you want to have true freedom and you want to have money that you can put into income producing assets, it's have a system. Have a system. You have to have a system and you have to be able to scale. And, and it's, it's that again, cart horse, you have to do the first part to figure out what's working because you've got to figure out what market, what market consistently pays you, right? What is the market that you consistently serve? You consistently pays you that you consistently get results to. That's what you then want to elevate next um, a lot of people are like, well, I want to go mar- push into another market. And I'm like, well, then you definitely need to systematize this one because you need all that energy and assets to go into this next market. Yeah. So, so something has to keep this wheel, this engine running while you go do that. So it is. And at that point, it is. A lot of it is they don't know. They don't know how to hire or actually. So I I actually went and learned about building marketing as a system. I don't do the marketing. I just assemble the people that do it. It's my company. It's my job to do that. Right. And so but it's my job to also go, what does my company need and who do I and then then it's just who do I need to do these things for my company? It becomes a much easier conversation. Right. So you've got to get out of pulling all of the levers. Um, And most people I will hear them like this is their retirement plan or this is their, um, you know, they do need the, the business to produce produce income so they can invest in other assets that take them into in into their phase. So you and you got you got to have a little gray hair going on upstairs like. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that kind of <laughs> tells me a little, another question about the is that a key characteristic of your best clients is that they've done 20 years in corporate life? Do they have to have done that or do you work 15 yeah, most of yeah, most of them are 5, 10 to 15. Um, and there's a re- there's a reason. Like they chose that path because there was a reason for it. And then this business ownership is the next thing. They're not done, they're not done working and they're not done serving. They're yeah. just done doing it on other people's terms. Yeah, that's we really both, yeah. We both stepped away. I stepped away in 2018. You know, that's, well, yeah. Again, I made my decision then actually. By the time I left, it was nearly end of 2019 but yeah i think that's common and i think it's is yeah the stats prove it out if you look at the number of small businesses set up in the small business administration or the amount of llc's registered across the country it's increased you know incredibly since the pandemic so yeah. there's lots of people doing this and i advise them to because ai is a new language model that will change everything so um it's good to have a business yes so it is good to it is good to have a business well i think people learned in pandemic that the safety of salary isn't really safe anymore yeah, we we just riding in a constant wave of layoff, and yet there's a, instead of complaining about it, I say to everybody, start your business. <laughs> Don't complain. Yeah. Yes, you can keep looking for work, but start a business. Start because a business. You need you need to have your own kingdom, and I think there is inspiring. nothing more powerful than going. I know how to make money. I know how to I know how to serve people. I know how to sell to people. Yeah. I know there's nothing more confident going, I can go to a networking group, I can go meet some connections, et cetera. And this month, I can put money in my bank account for my family. There's nothing more, there is no more, conf- that is like one of the most confident feelings in the world is go, I can make this happen. And that's where my next question, so that was a perfect segue, because I want <laughs> to know. I want people to know a bit about you, because we haven't talked about you, we've talked about your business and how you can help people. Yeah. So I'm not going to ask you, who are you? Because we'll get a 10 minute answer. We don't need that. <laughs> I do want to ask you kind of maybe some pointed questions. You know, what's your what's your reason now? So what drives you perhaps something that's bigger than you? What's your mission? So the interesting thing is I know something about myself. And one of my core whys is helping other, like literally the feeling of success for me is helping other people be successful. But to me. Why is that? I want to get right under the skin because I think that I think other people's, everyone I speak to says, oh, I say, what do you love doing? Oh, I like helping other people. Can we test that? And then I ask them questions about how they help other people and they never do because they or, think putting a door open is helping other people i said yeah that's no. not helping other people that's just a courtesy of life no i'll give i'll give you an example so when i left corporate first of all i never wanted to be a coach i had three business coaches in my first six months and not one of them helped me make a dime and so i thought coaching was a big hoo-ha so let's just we'll just put that on the table so okay um 
And so what I really wanted to do was I wanted people to be a better version of themselves. And what I wanted to do was be able, help them be able to break through limitations and actually be the person that they thought they had potential to be. So I launched a hypnotherapy business. And so I loved the, 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 I loved the ability to help people solve, solve problems that were holding them back and set them free to experience the success, joy, et cetera. Like for me, I love making sense of complicated problems and going, ah, it's this simple, this, 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 and let's just do this. And to me, hypnotherapy was a way to help people be better version, make sense of their complicated problem and give them a simple path. Yeah, I, I'm still going to push. Why? <laughs> because is life is too short to stay stuck. There we go. That's why. <laughs> this life is too short to stay stuck. Okay, and I, so we, we got, we got, I don't know, 50 minutes into this, maybe. <laughs> if you're watching, now you know why Andrea can help you. Because life is too short to stay stuck. Yeah, so my phrase is very similar. Stop playing small. You can life play is small too short you like. to, there's be, no, you'll be, you'll be there's one of those no reason to stay stuck. Yeah. Like there's, there's no reason because there is a solution that moves you forward. There's just no reason to stay stuck. So here's but here's the reason here's the thing. Helping my clients do that in hypnotherapy wasn't enough. I was like, okay, well, I've built a really amazing practice. I'm actually like I'm at 15 grand a month recurring revenue months for a hypnotherapist, which is most of them never get there. And I was like, okay, well, I've overcome this and I've built this. Who can I teach this to so they can do it too? Because to me, when other people, the right, the tie, when the team is winning, we're all winning. Like if it's just for me, myself and I, I'll just go be a boring cat lady in a townhouse and just, you know, write anonymous books or something. But um, so for me, it's like when figuring things out and then teaching other people how it works and how they can make it work and help them do it. That's more fun because then it's like somebody else is now doing it too. And now they're out helping 10,000 people in the lifetime. And then they're out helping 10,000 people in the lifetime. I can't help a million people personally, but if I help a hundred people, help another hundred people, help another hundred people, we reach a million people, right? And so- okay. So in my mind, it's just life is too short to stay stuck. And I figured out ways to get myself unstuck. And I was just like, can I make it easier for others? Because it's just stupid to struggle alone. And that's just, that's my belief and philosophy. So um, I love it. I love it. I want to ask you one more question before we ask okay. you uh, how we can get hold of you and, and people can reach out to you, even though by now they've looked in the show notes. Yeah. You've, you've surrounded yourself with little family there. And I want to ask you if... You weren't in the room today, and I had them all on Zoom with me, and I yeah. said to them, okay, tell me about mum or your wife or Andrea. <laughs> what would they say? What would we hear from them? What's the ultimate verification of who you are? Oh, my gosh. So my, it's funny. My teenage daughters have told me this. When your teenage daughters pay you a compliment, you're like you, I feel like you're doing something <laughs> right, okay? And they'll, so it's funny because they give me, they tell me stuff all the time. So my husband will tell people, my wife is ridiculously smart. Like, don't mess with her because she will see through your, oh, I'm sorry. I don't know if I can say that, but he'll say she'll, <laughs> he goes, you should come with a warning label for people. <laughs> He's like, my wife is ridiculously smart and she will see through your BS. So don't come with BS because it just doesn't work. Um, my teenagers will say, well, one of my teenagers told me recently, in fact, last night, my 15 year old was purposely hanging out. We were running around. We were going grocery shopping this and she goes, you know, a lot of kids at school don't like their parents. I like hanging out with you guys. You do things weird. You don't do things normal. You make things funny. Um, and you make life feel not so hard. Um, and so to me, that was like the ultimate complicate, the ultimate compliment. They will tell you that I'm always working on something, always read reading, ridiculously driven. They're like, mom will always want to find a better, find a way. Or she'll be like, hey, that could have been fixed. Like she'll they'll say, I'll always find the flaw. Um, because that's what mom, you know, that's what moms do. Yeah, um, I, this is good. I I wanted people to hear. Like, I'm gonna talk to the audience for a second. So if you need a coach who's going to coach you as a coach or a service-based business owner, you're in consulting or you're doing expert, expert practitioner work. What I just heard, and I think you heard it too, and I want to recap it is, why wouldn't you want to work with a coach who's not going to BS you? It's going <laughs> yeah. to be specific, non-fluffy stuff. It's going to just cut to the chase, right? So that'd be the first thing I heard. Second thing I heard is, 
contrarian opinion. <laughs> uh, he said weird, but what I see, what I hear is okay. It means you're just not going to get conformity. You're not going to get the normal, just run of the mill stuff. You're going to get some different perspectives. Yeah. And, I, and I think that's one of the ultimate things with any good coach is a different perspective. Yeah. Then we heard humor. Yeah. And I want to work with somebody who can inject some humor into the process because I don't want to work with a coach who's not fun. You want to be fun. <laughs> Otherwise, well, yeah, sure, yeah. be intense, but it, it should there should be some humor in there. And then the last thing I heard you say was, if you, I always think modeling is great. So you said you're, you're always kind of where well, you're reading books and you're learning and you're taking big things on and doing things differently. All I hear there is that's a challenge. You're challenging yourself. So in a role model behavior, people watching, wouldn't <laughs> you want the coach who's challenged themselves so they know what you're going through because you're setting yourself a challenge? You know, we've talked about business ownership today. Yeah. And what I see in Andrea is that, that yeah. she's challenging herself so she can challenge you. But that means that you can step into that same thing. I think the ability for you to compete with yourself is so powerful. And that's why I, I think that's so good. Yeah. All right. well, are, isn't uh, this journey kind of like about competing with ourselves? Like I think all of it. Yeah, you, you have to compete with who you are. I, At I the end of the day, we're pr this is about proving to ourselves that we can do this. We can say it's for my family. Like I can say improving to my kid. But at the end of the day, it's we're really proving to ourselves, can we do this? Do Yeah, do hard things. Do hard things. Do hard and things. Yeah. Have different, if you want different things in life, you have to do things that you didn't think you'd ever do. Yeah. I, um, have you ever come across Nick Peterson? He's had one, oh. of, his, his, one of his yeah. questions is this, write down everything you need to do that you don't know how to do. And his his philosophy is you do know, but you're so scared and so frightened and so worried about other people's judgment and re rejection and your reputation and that someone once said to you it couldn't be done, that you've shut down the parts of your brain that can actually do those things. Yeah. And I, and I think Andrea's testament to that because she's doing things that if you go back to 2017, she didn't think she could do now. Never. But she, but she, <laughs> but she did it. <laughs> and so the still day, doing it and still, it's still evolving through it, right? We just, yeah. it's you evolve so, and you evolve, continue to evolve. That's all let, it is. Let's, let's wrap this up. I want them to find you. So, so yeah. where is the best place to get you? Is that a website, an email address? Is it LinkedIn? Tell me the best place, and we'll put that top of the list. Yeah, LinkedIn is probably the best place to find me. Okay. Um, and send me a connection request. And, and, and then, and then the thing is, is that whether you want to work with me or not, the first thing is, is I tell people the question that you asked, like, right, who are you? What do you, how do, what do you do? And if I, I think it's probably the day I help people get unstuck. Nice. Because life's too short to stay unstuck. And so if you want that clarity about yourself, the first thing I will do is take you through a Y, right, through Y exercise, help you understand your unique operating system, help you find those words about what is it that you are best at doing. And I know that about me. And so I engineer my life about that. So LinkedIn is the best place. And then from there, you'll find my website, youruniquesuccess.com. But that's the best place to start for now. Thanks very much to Andrea today for talking us through about how you could build a business as a coach and service provider. I'm going to take a look at another video that I recorded for you. Just go and click on the link right there and I'll see you inside.